What do you get when you blend John Woo films, 1940s film noir, comic books, and video games? One very messed up looking smoothie. Max Payne is one such smoothie that is both messed up and delicious at the same time. A cult classic critical darling of the early 2000s whose style didn't necessarily come out of nowhere but had a very unique look and feel. So what exactly made this constipation smoldering stud stand out from the crowd the same year that Halo Combat Evolved, Grand Theft Auto 3, and Devil May Cry released? Let's go ahead and dive in guns blazing. Max Payne's beginnings were humble. Finished developer Remedy Entertainment's second title after Death Rally. The company had several ideas for their next game floating around and was torn on which project to take up next. They decided to contact Scott Miller for advice, founder of Apogee Software, later known as 3D Realms. Miller recommended the studio follow through on their prototype third-person action game, then titled Dark Justice, and name it after the game's main character. Remedy followed his advice and signed a deal with 3D Realms, marking the beginning of the game's production. It was a long development cycle, lasting about five years, going through some major reworks along the way. Originally, a multiplayer feature was included, but later dropped. Interestingly, Sam Lake, head writer and character model for Max Payne, has mentioned that the bullet time effect, as well as the Acer lobby scene, coincidentally mirrored the Matrix. A more perfect stage could not have been set for a game featuring slow motion gunplay. The game engine is Remedy's own Max FX, which was only used in Max Payne 1 and 2. In July 2001, Max Max Payne released first to PC, published by Gathering of Developers, then later ported to PS2 and Xbox by Rockstar Games. Max Payne, the intense story of a fugitive undercover cop who is framed for murder. A man with nothing to lose. Revolutionary bullet time gameplay slows down the action, showing bullets in flight, giving Max the edge against impossible odds. Shortly after, the title won a BAFTA award for Best PC Game of 2001, among many others. The rest is history. I cannot overstate how big of an influence bullet time or slow motion in general has had on our media since its popularization in the late 90s. It's open to debate on whether it's overstated its welcome or not, but many films and games still rely on the effect as a stylistic element. That isn't the singular reason this game became an instant classic, however, and it wasn't even the first game to utilize a bullet time-like mechanic. Max Payne just used it so well it became a ubiquitous feature in shooters. By the way, the term bullet time is owned by Warner Brothers, so I gotta pay them $4,000 every time I say it. Like and subscribe to contribute to the Warner Brothers war chest. Alright kids, it's story time, so if you want to avoid spoilers, just close your eyes and plug your ears for the next 8 or 9 minutes. Here we go. NYPD detective Max Payne was a man living the American dream. A great job, a house, a loving wife, and an infant child. One day, three years ago, that all changed. We open on Max returning home to silence. A strange graffiti symbol of a syringe inside of the letter V is on the wall in the entryway. The telephone rings and Max hurriedly picks up, asking for help, realizing a break-in is in progress. A menacing sounding woman is on the other end, checking in on the situation, who quickly hangs up on Max, disregarding his pleas. He proceeds up the stairs where the sounds of his screaming wife and child suddenly pierce the silence. A pair of mentally unstable men wielding guns burst out of the child's room. The infant has been been murdered. Max kills the last intruder in the bedroom only to find his wife Michelle laying dead. No! The killers were under the influence of the novel drug Valkyr, or V for short. Fast forward three years. Max is transferred to the DEA, investigating the origins of V. The case leads him and partners Alex Balder and Bibi to one Jack Lupino of the Punchinello crime family. Max goes undercover to infiltrate the organization. Bibi calls Payne with a message to meet Alex immediately at Roscoe Street train station for urgent info regarding Lupino. Once at the station, Max encounters low-level gangsters massacring innocent civilians and transit police. With no choice other than to shoot his way through, Payne's slow-motion slaughters every wise guy with a gun between him and Alex. Along the way, he stumbles upon a bank robbery in progress. The robbers were after Acer Corporation Bonds, a wildly successful company based in New York. Max and Alex finally meet to discuss Lupino's operation at the bank, but before they can finish, a mysterious gunman kills Alex and flees the scene. We gotta get out of here. If it's Lupino, it's... Alex? Alex! 
Figuring it to be Jack attempting to frame Max and his partner's murder, Payne makes his way to Lupino's hotel brothel in search of answers. A pair of enforcers known as the Finito brothers await to kill Max, as his position of undercover cop has been blown. A letter on the Finito's desk details a Valkyr deal set to take place at the hotel, under the orders of Jack Lupino's lieutenant, Vinny Gogniti. Another enforcer named Rico Muerte, a legendarily ruthless assassin, was assigned to oversee the deal. Max heads to Muerte's hotel room, where a second letter, written by Don Punchinello himself, reveals the big boss's involvement in the trafficking of Valkyr. In another hotel room, Payne stumbles upon a secret porn recording setup between hooker Candy Dawn and her regular client One-Eyed Alfred. Candy's been selling the tapes to an anonymous woman she refers to as the Mystery Hag. A once-in-a-lifetime winter storm has been battering the city. At the same time, the Valkyr drug has tightened its chokehold on the population. Max Payne makes his way through the hotel, out to the freezing streets, where he witnesses bombs being set off in Jack Lupino's business properties. Just after, a black car drives away, carrying a getaway driver and Russian mob boss Vladimir, signaling the start of a gang war. Max heads into the tenement buildings, where he is contacted by a man named Alfred Woden, who warns Max of the incoming police units and promises to contact him again. Payne finds and chases down Vinny Gogniti, pressing him for Lupino's whereabouts. Gogniti points Max to the Ragnarok, a nightclub whose name is a wordplay on the Norse mythological event in which the world is submerged in water, the final stage of the end of the world. Inside the club, Max finds various collections of literature related to the occult, like a smorgasbord of diabolical devilry. Deep within the heart of the Ragnarok, Ragnarok lays Lupino's inner sanctum, where Jack is heard praying to numerous dark entities for power. Emboldened by a heavy dose of V, rambling about the twilight winter, Jack screams, Her time is now, and all who stand in her way must die! <laughs> Max Payne promptly turns Lupino into Swiss cheese. Along walks in Mona Sachs, sister of Don Angelo Punchinello's wife, Lisa. With guns turned on each other, Max and Mona discuss their common goal of killing killing Angelo, Mona's reason being her sister's abuse at the hands of Don Angelo. After having a drink with Mona, we come to the part that everyone remembers this game for. Payne falls into a nightmare world, searching his way through a series of long hallways and a horrifically disturbing blood maze punctuated by the cries of his wife and child. No, 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 please God, no. At the end of the maze, he relives his family's murder, seeing himself as the killer. Jesus Christ. Whoever designed this level, I'm calling the FBI. Max awakens tied to a chair in front of Frankie the Bat in the basement of a warehouse. Thankfully, Max's adamantium-lined skull protects him from the repeated blows of the bat's bat. In the moments Frankie walks away for a drink, Max breaks free, shooting his way back up to the hotel bar to repay the bat's favors. We find in the aftermath a copy of Frankie's shockingly favorite comic strip, Captain Baseball Bat Boy. Payne drives away, but is quickly stopped by Vladimir, who has an offer Max can't refuse. One of Vlad's former employees is captaining a cargo ship in the Brooklyn Riverfront named the Karen, after the ferryman of Hades in Greek mythology. The ship is filled with weaponry destined for the Punchinello family, as Vlad's defector watches over it. In exchange for securing the ship, Payne is allowed his pick of weaponry for his crusade against Don Angelo. Max agrees to the deal, gunning down countless non-union stevedores on the path to the Karen. After securing the ship from the dime and carrying a duffel bag full of guns, Payne attempts to lure Don Punchinello out of his manor by offering the Karen back to him. Angelo Angelo agrees to meet at his restaurant. Max arrives only to have the building explode around him. Fortunately, a secret sewer tunnel leads to the outside, where Payne is again chauffeured away by Vlad, this time to the Punchinello Manor. Upon arrival, Max proceeds through the back door, only to find some of the guards killed already. Payne believes it to be the work of Mona Sachs, having been captured and fighting her way out of the manor. In the kitchen, Max finds three tarot cards, symbolizing the tower, death, and the devil. After the rest of the manor's personnel are blown away, we find Don Angelo in his office, on the phone begging for help. Before Max can plug him once and for all, a group of suited men kill Angelo and force Payne to surrender. Max is injected with a lethal dose of Valkyr by a mysterious woman, laying claim to her brew. The mystery hag tells her henchmen to take her back to cold steel, just as Max passes out. Again, Payne finds himself having to escape a nightmare, this time involving breaking the fourth wall. The truth was a burning green crack through my brain, weapon statistics hanging in the air glimpsed out of the corner of my eye, endless repetition of the act of shooting, time slowing down to show off my moves, 
The paranoid feel of someone controlling my every step. I was in a computer game. Funny as hell, it was the most horrible thing I could think of. Again, we are subjugated to the mind-searing blood maze and reimagining of the Payne family's murders. God damn, dude. You know, for a super drug like Valkyr, there sure is an appalling lack of good trips. Max wakes up, proving he has a higher drug tolerance than Hunter Thompson, and makes his way to the Cold Steel factory to confront the mystery hag. An elevator labeled D6 takes Payne down to the secret laboratories, where V is being mass-produced and tested. The lab's self-destruct sequence has been initiated, leaving Max with only a few minutes to find out what's been going on. A symbol on the floor clues us in on the origins of the graffiti on the wall of Max's house, with the insignia of an electric V and a sword through it. Project Valhalla is emblazoned on the floor of the labs. Max comes across a computer containing the relevant history of the project, beginning in 1991 as an effort to create a performance-enhancing drug for American soldiers during the Gulf War. The project was officially canceled after unsatisfactory results, but our mystery hag kept it alive underground. Their first field test of the drug? Max Payne's house, three years ago. If his mission wasn't personal before, it is now. Barely making it out in time. All of Project Valhalla goes up in flames, leaving Max without the evidence of the origins of Valkyr. Max's partner, Bibi, tells him to meet at an old parking garage. Backstabbing bastard was in on the Valhalla scheme the whole time, and was ostensibly paid to kill Alex for getting too close to the truth. Payne teaches Bibi and his legion of trench coat wearing thugs the meaning of justice with a couple thousand bullets. Alfred Woden calls Max on a payphone in the parking garage telling him to meet at the Asgard building. Woden, wearing glasses with one eye covered, informs Max of his involvements in Project Valhalla's origin. Nicole Horn, president of Acer Corporation and Mystery Hag, was the one keeping the project alive. Woden and Max strike a deal. Alfred has the power to clear all criminal charges against Payne in exchange for killing Nicole. Their meeting is adjourned as men in black storm in and kill everyone in attendance. Max makes a narrow escape out the window. Woden is seen on a security camera walking away from the aftermath of the meeting. A videotape of Alfred and Candy Dawn, the hooker with the secret recording setup, lays on a table with an extortion letter next to it. Payne takes the evidence with him for once. Our hero fights his way through Asgard, eventually arriving at Acer Corporation headquarters to face off against Nicole Horn. Mona Sachs appears in an elevator, filling Payne in on her role in killing Punchinello on behalf of Nicole for the sake of cutting Horn's ties to the Mafia. Nicole orders Mona to kill Payne, but Sachs refuses. She is subsequently shot and disappears down the elevator. She is not seen again. Nicole taunts Payne the rest of the way up, reminding him of the family he once had that he can never go back to. The fight to the top of the tower is long and ends spectacularly when Max brings down a signal tower on Nicole Horn's helicopter. The police surround Payne and lead him to a squad car, where Alfred Woden watches confidently from the crowd. Max has won. For now. So the story is ridiculous, outlandish, and unbelievable, and the ending isn't exactly a happy one. But neither are a lot of film noir endings, which is what Sam Lake and the writers were going for. Asking ourselves questions like, why would Horn choose a detective's house as the first test site for Valkyr? Isn't that kind of a dumb idea? Or why didn't she just kill Max when she had the chance? Are pointless questions because this was never a story meant to be taken too seriously. Just like the Hong Kong action films this game was inspired by, the plot mainly serves to take us from one gunfight to the next. It achieves that harmony between playing the premise straight while also being tongue-in-cheek, winking and nodding to the audience the whole time. Karaoke never was my scene. One thing that surprised me is that they didn't touch on Max Payne's slow motion superpower. Like even just one line where someone says, you know, Max Payne has always had crazy good reflexes. But no, there's no explanation. This very average build undercover DEA agent has the acrobatic skill of a Hollywood stuntman combined with the speed of the flash. Uh, just roll with it, okay? The obvious mythological references are pretty funny. Alex Balder, the Ragna Rock, one-eyed Alfred Woden, Odin? At the same time, we have Max's gruesome nightmares and dark, serious tone during the dialogue sequences. It's equally as cheesy as it is grim. A perfect balance for a B-movie type game. Well played, Sam Lake. Well played. Speaking of, let's talk about gameplay. Max Payne doesn't seem to like Windows 10, so I had to use a couple of mods to get the sound to work properly and the widescreen stretch fixed. Those were easy enough to find in Steam's guide page, though. I also had to run it in compatibility mode for Windows 98. Pretty routine stuff for older games. The bullet time mechanic is extremely useful, but doesn't 
doesn't necessarily need to be relied on to make it through any particular gunfight. You can use cover, but enemies will sometimes charge or throw grenades. There's a small selection of weapons at your disposal, from a baseball bat to a grenade launcher, all of which have particular uses in different scenarios. The sniper rifle comes in handy in very specific parts, but it has the coolest effect where the camera follows the bullet through the air for a few moments after firing. There are trade-offs with every weapon that only through trial and error will you figure out. Movements need to be precisely timed, and the right weapons in the right circumstances make all the difference. Just running into a room and blasting away will not work ever. While their actions and movements are scripted, enemies will constantly keep you on your toes, diving out into hallways or busting out of shipping containers when you least expect it. Going into bullet time automatically reloads your gun, so by emptying a mag, then going slow-mo, you effectively override the need to reload. You'll want to use every trick available, because this game is difficult. Three or four shots will take you down on the easiest difficulty, so quick saving progress every minute or so is essential. Hard boiled and dead on arrival difficulties give you less health, fewer pickups, tougher enemies, and slower health regen. New York Minute Mode gives you a limited amount of time to finish the levels, for all you speedrunners out there. No health pickup is ever wasted, which by the way are painkillers. Fucking genius. You'll want to use a technique I call save, which stands for save after every encounter. What? What do you mean acronyms don't work like that? If you kill somebody, save the game. Jump to a platform, hit save. Walk 20 feet, uh, you get it. Particularly during the blood mazes where you need to use precise maneuvers to avoid falling off, I was smashing that F5 button every few steps. The pacing overall is pretty good because after every few gun battles, there's some short exploration and platforming parts. The platforming itself is not great though, requiring pixel perfect jumps with the clunky in-air control. Max Payne ain't exactly Mario over here. That makes for some frustrating situations, which brings me to to the bugginess of movement. In a lot of parts, I was being blocked from running in certain directions for short periods of time, which seems to be a common problem. This extends to NPCs who will run in place during eventful or action-packed in-game cutscenes. It is pretty funny though. After a while, I figured out you just have to pause and unpause to fix it. I had to look up the fact that diving to the side is more reliable than jumping from platforms in the blood mazes. Sometimes it wouldn't let me jump forward, which I discovered is a problem when in bullet time as well. Otherwise, the slow motion mechanic feels amazing. Watching bullets fly past or break chunks out of walls gives me that little tickle that puts a big dumb grin on my face. It led to me audibly saying, holy shit, after even some of the smaller battles. While the textures are a little blurry by today's standards, they still hold up astoundingly well. Well, this was mind-blowing fidelity for 2001. It may seem like a trivial detail, but something like good-looking muzzle flashes could wow an audience at E3 in the late 1990s. Fully rendered bullets and cartridge cases were big talking points for in-game effects at the time. The particles were fairly impressive, what with all the debris created by explosions or gunshots. Max Payne's leather coat swaying back and forth as he runs was particularly notable. Remedy didn't have proper motion capture technology during development, so they instead took videos of all the actions performed in the game and animated them by hand based off of the footage. It looks convincing, for the most part. For source material on the environment, Remedy hired two ex-police officers to escort their photographers through the seediest parts of New York City. That decision paid off because the landscapes from the streets, rooftops, and interiors are all wonderfully full of character. Most of the dialogue is expressed through hand-painted comic panels based off of pictures of Remedy's own employees dressed in costumes. The same is true for the in-game models that even featured the studio's vending machine attendant as one of the henchmen. The lighting is dark and moody with a surprisingly varied color palette. Light and shadow were used to create a distinct style highlighting the game's film noir inspirations. They went so far as to include little things like a short Twin Peaks reference and an episode of a soap opera on one of the TVs. Yes, my lord, we should both be dead, for this shame is too great for the living. My lord, I am... My lord, I am your long-lost sister! <laughs> That show really jumped the shark. It's pretty funny that the characters don't move their mouths when speaking. Gex Enter the Gecko had that figured out three years earlier. Beat the Matterhorn, what are you gonna do? Remedy announced this year that they would be working on remakes for Max Payne 1 and 2, so I wonder what kind of changes that will bring. The facial expressions are just incredible though. I hope those stay in. One feature of remakes I personally appreciate is the ability to change from new to old graphics on the fly. I'm not an expert on game creation, so I don't know how hard it is to do this, but please game developers, please try to include this component when you can. 
again. The Spyro and Crash Bandicoot remakes are fantastic, and having the legacy graphics option available would make them perfect. Max Payne's sound design is phenomenal. From the ghostly drone of the raging winter storm outside, to the chaotic cacophony of barking dogs and muffled conversations of the interiors, this game oozes atmosphere. Thank you. More so than the visual aspects, the distant echoing cries of Max's wife and baby made me shudder through the blood mazes. As psychologically damaging as these nightmare levels are, I couldn't help but appreciate the effect the audio created. A good litmus test for a shooter is its shotgun, and this is easily in my top three best sounding shotguns ever. While not terribly realistic, all of the gun sounds are satisfyingly chunky. This game also does something with the hand grenades I haven't experienced very often, which is give them weight. They slap the floors and walls with loud punches instead of the usual dinky tissue paper grenades a lot of games seem to go with. It just feels better to throw these absolute bricks down a hallway over your average explosive pebble. Little touches like this add up. While I couldn't find much information on composers Kartsi Hataka and Kimo Kajasto, their work shines through. You'll want to turn the music volume down quite a bit though, because the mixing can sometimes drown out the dialogue. The rock-oriented action music that comes up during particular gunfights is incredibly loud and distracting, so just do your eardrums a favor and dial it down right off the bat. The main theme is such an earworm, it almost drove me crazy playing over and over in my head while brushing my teeth or running errands. This is a good thing though, because that's what a main theme is supposed to do. It's a memorable melody meant to keep your mind on the game in some way even when you aren't playing it. Keep you coming back even if to just get the damn song out of your head. The rest of the soundtrack features mysterious synthesizer sounds, deep oppressive drums, echoing electric guitars, and creepy choruses. There's even some minor key surfer music dropped in here and there. It's all a pitch perfect reflection of the tone of the game. Eavesdropping on the NPC conversations is always a treat. Give me the detonator. What are you talking about? The detonator. I thought you'd bring it. You were supposed to bring it. Yeah, right. Just forget about it. <laughs> just forget about it. Hey, just forget about it. Stereotypical East Coast Italian wise guy accents will never not be funny to me as an Italian-American myself. On the whole, there's some superb voice acting. I can tell the actors had a lot of fun with it. They're all chewing the scenery through the cheesy dialogue, with James McCaffrey contrasting as our melodramatic main character. His acting rides the line of sounding either terribly bored or appropriately dead inside, but his smoky, grizzled voice makes for an excellent casting decision. It's unfortunate for actors who fill a role so perfectly they are forever seen as those characters for the rest of their lives, but no one else could have done Max Payne. What a legend. With their intriguing future fusion of action, horror, mystery, and humor, Remedy Entertainment created a classic that stands the test of time. While the level design is linear, each chapter brings with it densely packed environments, challenging combat, moments of levity, and an engaging, if a bit absurd, storyline. Max Payne is a love letter to several different genres of film and video game, crafted with care and serious attention to detail. This is one of those games that I will keep coming back to for as long as I live. I try to avoid looking at older games with rose-tinted glass because to me, nostalgia is a double-edged sword. Yes, you get that glint in your eye as you remember a time when you didn't realize how fucked up the world is, but corporate entities love nothing more than to exploit that emotion by relying on lazily rehashing old IPs with an appeal to nostalgia, while continuing to dodge paying their taxes and generally making the world a shittier place to live in, further strengthening your drive to go back to a time when things were, quote, better. Even so, I found myself feeling the same things I did when I was 12 years old, playing this on my best friend's Xbox at sleepovers. 2001 was an incredible year for video games, with Max Payne punctuating that unique time period of creativity in the industry. While many developers were churning out endless sequels or bad movie tie-ins, we also saw some fantastic new franchises come out of that era. The lesson of the day is, don't be afraid to stand out, whether it's in your fashion choices, creative decisions, whatever. If it resonates with you, chances are it'll 
resonate with others as well, as long as you aren't hurting anyone else in the process. Your uniqueness is something to be cherished, not stifled. Certain indignant shit heels will try to comfort themselves by putting other people down who don't follow the formula, usually because they were too afraid to go their own way and they need to cope with that somehow. Don't ever let their insecurities about their lives dictate the decisions you make in your own.